Hello there and welcome back to another episode of Cloud with Chris. You're with me, Chris Reddington, and here we talk about all things cloud. Now thank you again for joining today in this session which is live. We are doing a live session this week, something a little bit different. Uh, normally we obviously have the uh, pre-recorded sessions or sometimes live streams on a Friday, uh, but uh, a special episode this week and one I've been really looking forward to here. So some of you may know, I've spoken about it a few times on Cloud with Chris, about the website that I build, how I build it, and uh, some of the tools that I use like GitHub amongst other tools as well. But I do a lot of these as meetup talks. We kind of scrape the surface on things. And really we wanted an opportunity to take it a little bit further. We wanted an opportunity to go in a lot more depth. So I'm really pleased tonight to be joined by Carl Cook, who's going to be leading the way here today so rather than me being the host uh i'm going to be taking the guest seat today and i'm going to be uh in the hot seat so it's going to be quite an interesting experience for myself as well um so without further ado let's just go ahead and introduce carl here to the show hey carl good evening how are you doing great chris how are you oh good thank you all good thank you for joining and uh taking the interviewer interrogator i'm not quite sure we'll see a <laughs> role in this session we'll see where it goes to. exactly exactly so i guess maybe let's start off with some introductions first in terms of who you are and how we kind of arrived to actually doing this together i suppose so uh, my name's carl cook uh, or carl underscore it nerd if you follow me on twitter i am an implementation specialist at action point technology group um, mostly um, working with Azure, a wee bit of Microsoft 365, and a wee bit of everything else at the same time. Um, I blog at irishtechie.com, and I'm also the co-organizer for Limerick.net Azure User Group. So, sorry, I'm just making sure my mic's close to my face. Yeah. Okay. Tells me you can barely hear me, but uh, anyway, I blog at irishtechie.com. And um, I also co-organize the Limerick.net Azure user group, um, and that's actually where we first, um, where you first presented the GitHub, um, Go Hugo, um, get our GitHub Actions and Azure Storage, uh, blogging platform, or first presented it to me anyway. Sure. Um, so I to do this session to take a bit of a deeper dive into the into the underlying architecture and the decisions around the decisions you made. Um, uh, but when choosing Azure and the Hugo platform. Absolutely, absolutely. And thanks, John, for calling that out with Carl, by the way. I've uh, also on my side just made sure the uh, audio levels are as high as they can, but I didn't have much room. So hopefully we're all good there. Do shout if there's any issues there. But no, th thanks for that, Carl. And I guess at this point, I'm going to sit back, right? Because my job is done introing the show. Now I've got to go and... Uh, be ready to go and talk through all these things. So I guess to set the scene, you know, we're, we've got a few areas that we've broadly talked about we're going to explore, right, with the GitHub side, the Azure side. But other than that, we haven't really scripted out the deep side of things, what we're going to talk about. So we'll see where we end up because <laughs> we don't know either. So it's going to be kind of interesting. Um, so we'll see how that goes. So... I'm going to hand over to you now, Carl, and I'm going to bring up our screen share as well. So uh, we can use that as a bit of a basis for talking through things as well. Okay, excellent. So um, this session will be a, a, an interrogation or an interview. Um, <laughs> actually, more a deep dive, as I said, into the architecture and the workflow around the cloudwithchris.com website. So I know there's a lot of interest in the community about blo various blogging platforms and um, there are so many options. I, I'm going through the transition at the moment of moving irishtechie.com from GitHub Pages mm -hmm. and Jekyll through to the same platform that Chris is on. So I wanted to give the community an opportunity to ask their own questions. <laughs> to ask their own questions <laughs> and for me, uh, for us to all to find out a bit more about the platform and the decisions made. Okay, so Chris, the cloudwithchris.com website is a, a static website hosted in Azure Storage. Yes. It's served to the community using mm -hmm. Azure CDN. Correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong at any point here. Yep. So it makes use of GitHub Actions to manage your backlog, yep. content backlog, and to publish content. 
Would that be about right? Uh, GitHub overall to manage the backlog, uh, but GitHub Actions then is the, I guess, kind of used for uh, managing the backlog. There's some elements we can explore around that. But yeah, the whole deployment and the building of it all through GitHub Actions. Yeah, exactly. So, so basically, this is this is this is the infrastructure. The platform is Azure Storage. Yep. Uh, and a, and an Azure CDN front end. Azure. You you want to talk me through the architecture in a bit more detail? Mm. Um, because I know you have. If if anybody has caught any of Chris's, um, presentations like Limerick.net, um, Azure User Group, or the Global Azure, or the is it the Northern Azure User Group? You did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've done a fair few. Yeah. Where there are different slants on the the same discussion. Yeah, so yeah. Let's let's take a dive in, and there's a nice, awesome visual diagram <laughs> which I was you had. There we um, go. So let, let's take a deep, di a deeper dive into the the architecture here. Do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, yeah, sure. So here's one I made earlier. Um, so it's really simple, to be honest. It there's three kind of layers to it, um, and I wouldn't even say three layers, really two. Um, the first is just the DNS now. You know, we'll all know that when we go and visit a website, none of us like to remember that IP address of, you know, I go to 70 dot something dot something. You know, we don't remember numbers and uh, decimal points and all these things as humans. We remember names. So uh, that's firstly what's going on there. We've got the Azure DNS on the front end, public DNS zone there. Um, and I've got a number of records there. So my www dot and the kind of naked domain as well, or the Apex domain as it's known, um, both point to a CDN profile. So my Apex domain is basically just a redirect. It redirects to my dub dub dub. And then my www points to my backend uh, production storage account there. And it's a similar case actually for the two on the left hand side of the screen as well. So we've got preview, we've got staging as well. Um, and they both have a very, very similar approach there. And I'm sure we can get hands on and approach that a bit more later as well. Um, we've also got podcasts.cloudwithchris.com as well. Uh, so that's kind of where Cloud with, not even kind of, that is where cloudwithchris.com started. Uh, so podcast.cloudwithchris.com because I want to serve all of my content to places like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. So they're all streamed from the CDN there as well. So really just three layers. The DNS to actually, you know, give some easy to remember endpoints for the different locations that I've got. Uh, the CDN then to actually go and cache that for my users around the world. And I'm sure that's something we'll explore a bit later. And uh, then the storage accounts to go and store the content. And that's the elegant thing about this kind of architecture is it's all static content. So it's really easy to go ahead and just host it on something like a storage account, which is super cheap and super easy to use something like a CDN where you can easily distribute it around the world there. So yeah, that's the architecture in a nutshell. Excellent. So I see you're talking about the Apex domain there. So mm. um, if I remember correctly, the Apex domain isn't compatible with the automatic cert um, with the Azure CDN. So how are you handling that? Uh, so, yeah, I think what I'm doing, we can go and explore it, to be honest. <laughs> it's been a while since I've looked at it. But um, I think what I'm doing with that is I'm literally just taking the traffic and going, okay, that traffic is... Um, you know, is for the Apex domain, we're not actually going to serve anything from it. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, redirect it here. So okay. I've just... You're doing that with uh, CDN rules, are Exactly, you? exactly. So if I go and find that here, um, CDN profile, here we go. And da, 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 here's the Apex. So yeah, you can see there I've got HTTPS. Oh no, I have got a wildcard cert on it actually. Um, I have got a certificate on that as opposed to... Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's it. Um, I forgot I even did that. It was that long ago that I did that, to be honest. Um, but then what I do exactly right on the uh, rules engine side of it then, you know, if, or what I do is I just go ahead and uh, push the traffic over to uh, my dub 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 then. To be honest, I should probably just do it for any uh, traffic, not just HTTPS. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, no, sorry, I am doing always, yeah. What I'm saying is yeah. any traffic coming in, uh, it will always redirect uh, with a 301, um, so forcing it to go to the new site, uh, and then we're forcing HTTPS on the way over there. 
um, because you can have conditional rules over here in the rules engine as well. So for anyone who's not familiar, maybe just a quick <laughs> a quick step back for a second, because uh, I know I've jumped in quite quickly there. So the CDN uh, profile overall is where we go and manage the various CDN endpoints. So remember we had like dub 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 cloud with Chris podcast cloud with Chris preview uh, the apex domain and the staging. These are effectively all the different endpoints that you as an end user would go and connect to. But then, uh, you know, say, for example, I go in through the naked domain. What actually happens is you hit this rules engine, um, which just forces you over then to the www. So uh, I'm using the rules engine to kind of help me maintain some of my sites a bit there. And again, I know that that's something we'll explore a bit later with security and how I do some of those pieces as well. But uh, yeah, the rules engine is the magic key there. Okay, excellent. So I want to let's take a, a step back further down the down the architecture um, mm -hmm. diagram for a moment. Are, so back with your architecture diagram, you're you're underlying all of this are just standard Azure Blob storage accounts mm -hmm. with the the static website uh, setting enabled. Yes. So. Are, are there any special configurations you've got set up on the Azure storage account? Or are they just generally default? Um, so I think on my storage accounts, I think for my production ones, I've got um, the redundancy is like a read access geo redundant, just because if there was an issue, yeah, there we go, read access geo redundant, just because if there was an issue with, you know, one of the regions, then at least I can have a secondary endpoint for my origin. So typically when you think about a content delivery network or a CDN, um, you have this caching layer in the front, and then behind that is this thing called the origin. So where the content is coming from, the source of that really. Um, and what you can do now with Azure CDN, in fact, is have multiple origins. So what I could feasibly do, I don't think I've got it set up yet, to be honest, um, but if there was a time where I needed to go ahead uh, and let's say use multiple backend origins, for example, because my main region went down, well, what that will enable is if those points of presence across the globe, that content isn't cached there yet, they can still go and read that content in the event of a failure in my main region there. So um, if I navigate down to my properties, you can see I've got these couple of endpoints here blurred out because of one of the extensions that I'm using. Um, but they're effectively the two endpoints then that I would point the CDN to and to go and uh, basically pull the content from there. Excellent. So for anybody that's uh, that does these presentations, maybe to, um, to clients or in situations like that or like this, uh, that extension is called AZ Mask or AZ Mask. Um, which is available for Microsoft Edge. So recommend you go and get it. So it hides all of the, the critical information that you don't necessarily want to be sharing um, with clients or with viewers in a, in a situation like this. So highly recommend you go and check that out. Um, okay, so I noticed in your, in your architecture diagram, you have uh, a backup. And the only reason it jumps out at me is because um, Richard Hooper had asked a question about blob storage mm. replicating blob storage off to a completely different tenant earlier on Twitter. Yeah. I noticed that you have something like that in your mm. Azure, uh, in your architecture diagram. I suspect it's not going to a completely different tenant, but how are you handling the blob to blob um, replication or backup here? Yeah, great question. I'll be honest, I've actually turned that off now, so that's actually something I can decommission, I guess, in terms of my architecture, not that it would take long. Um, but what yeah. it was for was predominantly for those not really the website because the website is easy. I can go and easily rebuild the website, redeploy. So that wasn't really the part that I was worried about. Um, it was mainly for the podcast files themselves, the MP3 files, etc. Because you know, but there's a lot of time that goes into that, right? And creating that content, I would be devastated if I lost that and uh, had to start from scratch. Uh, so what I've got now actually i've upgraded my on-prem if we call it that way um right under my desk here i've got a synology nas where i've got it all backed up so i've got all my mp4s my mp3s all of that stuff all backed up there um but also what i'm doing now is i have my podcast files stored in git and we can explore that a bit later because some people may be raising their eyebrows at this point thinking that 
sounds a bit strange. That sounds a bit like an anti-pattern, uh, which yeah. on the face of it, it sounds like, but it's not. <laughs> we'll explain why later. Um, but to be honest, this I'm not really doing anymore. But to come back to your question, um, I think I was using uh, GitHub Action on a weekly basis, actually, on a weekly schedule. And all I was doing was going, right, AZ, copy, or whatever the equivalent was in the Azure CLI, um, copying the files from one storage account over to the other storage account and using that as a backup. So quite a rudimentary approach, but the challenge, and this is something that I see a lot of people misinterpreting actually, is when you think about things like the geo redundancy, the local redundancy, the zone redundant options inside of Azure Storage, that is not backup. That is replication and that is uh, being able to make sure that the data uh, stays with a certain level of integrity within Azure Storage, right? That's not a backup. So as soon as you write to that storage account, those other replicas are updated, which is why you would need to maintain some kind of you know, off-site backup almost, if that makes sense, which is what this was there. Um, and that's what the discussion was about on Twitter earlier. I think the, the gotcha. general agreed um, solution for that was certainly AZ copy yeah. related. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think we settled on Azure, an Azure function to do it. Azure have wrap by AZ copy and an Azure function and send it off to, to a completely different Bob storage account. But anyway, let, let's um, talk more about your Azure storage then. So your static website, all of your content mm -hmm. um, goes into this storage account. And, and I should say, while we're talking about backups, all, this entire blog and its supporting resources all exist in a Git repository in GitHub. Yes. So in terms of a backup, if, if Azure melted down tomorrow, mm -hmm. Chris and anybody that's doing this sort of this sort of architecture and blog design or blog platform mm -hmm. is able just to point their Git repo, GitHub repo, at another platform yeah. and deploy to it. And, uh, and think, I think, it, in fact, you talked at the Limerick.net Azure user group. That's quite a mouthful. So I'm going to go back to LDNA for that one. <laughs> Sounds good. At, at LDNA, you talked about um, actually doing that to Google Cloud and yep. AWS at one point. Yep. So are you... Are, We'll get on to storage consumption in a minute, but I just wanted to flag that um, this is a Git repo. So the platform we've chosen is Azure because we all love Azure, but it's quite easy to go and point this platform or this blog content at another static web hosting mm. environment as long as you can get at it through GitHub. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the infrastructure side of it, um, I'll be honest, for AWS and for GCP, I've done manually um, because, you know, it was more of an experiment on my side, just understanding those platforms, how would I achieve the same thing on there? Um, and that's going to be, it's somewhere on my backlog. It's just quite low down compared to all the other things that are on there. And I'm sure everyone else is similar that they've got so much work to uh, focus on and go and do. Um but yeah, the point that you were saying there about deploying to the different, uh, the different environments almost, there, the different platforms. What I have is I build the site. I've, I've got various environments that I build it for. So like a preview, a staging, a production, for example. And then in the staging environment, and that's the only environment I do this, by the way, um, I build it. And then I published to three different environments. Uh, so one of those being Azure, one of those being GCP, one of those being AWS. So if I just zoom in a bit here, um, what you'll see is within GitHub Actions, uh, we can define these different stages effectively. And the reason this is nice is because you can associate a stage with an environment. An environment gives you some extra benefits, being able to go ahead and uh, put manual approvals in place, for example. So what I could do is I could go ahead and say, whoa, 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 you're not allowed to deploy to staging until Chris has gone and approved that. Or the other benefit, which I really like, I'm a huge advocate of this uh, from a DevOps perspective in general, is principle of least privilege. So we all think about it for users, but what about those service accounts? What about those service principles that are automated? What happens if that gets compromised? What's the blast radius of that? Yeah. Not so, everybody needs to be an owner. Exactly. Not service account needs to be an owner that's a bad idea exactly and this is why i have different service principles for my different environments and yes i've got them all in the same resource group but you know my scenario is to be honest quite lightweight um i don't need to worry about different resource groups 
I could, and you know, maybe I'll re-architect someday and factor that in if I want. But the way I've put those service principles together, um, I've gone ahead and assigned the access control to the individual storage accounts. So they do quite literally only have access to what they need access to and no more. Uh, so right. if there was a breach of my staging, that's fine. You know, it's no problem. It's just a staging content, which I... The, bla the Yeah, the blast radius is, is limited, as you're saying. Exactly. 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 So yeah, we've got that for um, publish Azure step, and effectively the steps are download the artifacts, log into Azure, upload to the storage account, purge the CDN. Now, I don't have CDN in front of my uh, AWS or GCP deployments at the moment. That's, again, something that is kind of interesting, actually, and maybe we won't go too much into the weeds on this one, but uh, this pattern that we're talking about here is based upon an architecture design pattern called the static content hosting pattern. And effectively, what it explains is you can host your content somewhere which is a storage kind of endpoint. So, you know, an S3, a Google storage, an Azure storage account, for example. But you need that endpoint to be HTTP or HTTPS accessible. Now, to bore, uh, not to spare from boring all the details, I should say, um, I want to make sure that I'm serving from HTTPS just to make sure that we're getting a consistent experience no matter which cloud endpoint you hit. The way that AWS and GCP influence those are slightly different. So, you know, the deployment itself is very similar, as you'll see. Download the artifacts, authenticate to Google Cloud, go and upload uh, content to Google Cloud Storage. Um, same with AWS. Authenticate with AWS credentials, go and upload the content to uh, my staging S3 bucket. All very similar. But in terms of the implementation detail of the cloud architecture, that's where things start to differ. For example, with Google Cloud, uh, I think the solution meant that I needed to go ahead and place a load balancer in front of the storage account. And then obviously that would drive up my cost um, quite significantly to the pennies that I'm paying there right now. Uh, so it wasn't really something that I wanted to explore at the time. I didn't really have the need to do that. And as I've said many times when I've spoken uh, about this architecture overall before, it's it's a community website. It's something which is done in my spare time and I don't want it to be costing tons and tons of money. So as much as I can keep those costs down, that is a big requirement for me. So that's why I haven't really gone down those paths yet. But as you say, absolutely possible. Um, and I guess with things like Terraform as well, it can be even easier to go and have this, uh, you know, almost consistent because you're not defining the infrastructure once. You need to define it for each platform, but you've at least got this consistent deployment tooling framework to go and use then. Um, so it's it's in the back of my mind, but, um, you know, I've I've gone through the POC stage, proven it works, and that's where I've kind of left it for now, I guess. Okay, excellent. So this, this platform uh, hosting on Azure Storage, as you alluded to there, will cost um it, people a, a bit of money now mm -hmm. given that it's a community website and it's a, it's it's azure storage and it's going to be um less than a gig or two it's generally not going to cost an awful lot no. but let's talk now about how you maintain because it will cost something so let's talk about how you maintain your low storage consumption are you running this through any compression passes before it hits the azure storage or or what are you doing just to maintain um five or six pound per month versus 15 or 20 pound per month gotcha and just to prove to everyone the five or six pound where's my last invoice here we go um so this is the resource group where i host everything four pounds 26 huge bill contributing back to microsoft there um four pounds 26 so that's uh what it costs for everything not just the website itself not just you know users going and using that but also the mp3 files being streamed through cdn for example to the likes of apple Podcasts. Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, uh, so that you know you can listen to them on your apps on the go. So that's how much it costs. Now, yes, there will be costs which scale over time, uh, because the costing model of that effectively is done on a almost a per, con per consumption basis. So if we think about you know number of users that are streaming podcast files or viewing the website, the more uh, that is transferred through the CDN, the higher the charge is going to be effectively, and it's a kind of a per gigabyte charge. So as you rightly say, optimizing on that transfer 
file size is going to help me. So, so the the smaller your storage account, um, you, the smaller the, the data footprint in your storage account is, mm -hmm. the smaller the amount of data traversing the CDN Absolutely. at the various points of presence. Therefore, the smaller your costs are for both your storage and your CDN. So, exactly. as, as you can see from this screen, um, from Chris's last invoice, the storage is the vast majority of that of that price per month. Um, and even that's not a massive price. So no. yeah, tell us how you manage that uh, to keep that storage low. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a couple of things. I think there's some compression I do on the way in, and I'll show that in a sec. But given we're still in the portal here, um, the other piece as well, and I guess this is less about cost, but more about end user experience efficiencies let's say is going back to the uh to the cdn here so one of the things you can do with the cdn is you can turn on compression and i believe by default it is turned on actually yes um but you can see in here for example all of the types of uh file formats which are compressed in cdn here so you'll see the things like the javascripts of the world the jpegs of the world the um html's of the world etc so to make sure that the end users are also getting some of those gains of compression being served on the way out um this is where cdn can really help with that so not necessarily a cost saving but just how i make sure again that that end user experience is as good as it can be for everyone no matter whether you're in the us or europe or australia when you're listening and viewing so that's one aspect um the other aspect then is when i go ahead and use my ci cd pipelines uh, or my github action workflows what i do is as soon as it hits my dev branch, so my staging environment, um, I then get a bit more rigorous in terms of the checks that I go and put in place. And again, I've got a huge backlog of stuff that I want to go and add in. I want to add more thorough testing uh, because I actually broke my website last week and I did know about it because I was kind of working on it at the time and I knew I was probably going to break stuff. But we can come back to that one because I think that's an interesting one to explore. Um, but it's on my list. Um, the typical changes I make aren't so drastic, which is why it's not high on the list. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm sidetracking now. I'm going to get back to this point, which is about um, the image compression. So what I do is I use a GitHub action, uh, which is called Calibre App Image Dash Actions. And one of the things that allows me to do there is to go ahead and uh, compress images uh, on their way in. So it's effectively github actions is like azure pipelines or GitLab or similar it's a way of automating what i might be doing at the keyboard so instead of me doing it there's just some automated workflow some automated pipeline that is replacing the dumb human here between the keyboards and the chair going ahead and doing something dumb and just following a script there um, that's effectively what github actions is doing for me here so I've got this action, which is basically taking the input, scanning the repository for any files which are not optimized from an image perspective, looking at those and going, right, okay, that is probably prime for compression. Let's go ahead and reduce that. So if I jump back to one of my uh, previous pull requests, wow, I did not even plan that. That is actually pretty cool. Um, I I merged some content earlier and I forgot that there was a JPEG in there. So that is very handy. Um, you can see here, for example, that before this one was uh, about 63K uh, there and now it's been reduced to 14. So I know, you know, when we're talking kilobytes, it's not huge, huge volumes of data right but when you start thinking about all of those images that are on a website and all of those you know mp3 files you might be streaming all of the css files it does all start adding up especially if you're on a mobile device where you're on 3g 4g or in my case the other day 5g i was quite excited about that and i've not had my covid injection yet so there's nothing to do with that <laughs> um, but yeah you can see here you know a 76 percent improvement and I'll be honest, a lot of the changes that I see when I'm reviewing these are probably in the ballpark of about 50 to 80 percent compression. So that's that's excellent. I mean, mm. in terms of JPEGs there, are you or even any image? Yeah. Um, are you noticing any any uh, any resolution or quality loss when no. this is happening? No, I haven't. Um, 
The only place I've noticed an issue, but this is more because of their standards than anything, is on Spotify. Uh, the episode images are a bit grainy, but that's because I resize my images to a consistent 250 by 250 because it works well on the site. And, you know, I've got to make a decision at some point. And I could go and have multiple versions of the image, but it's not such a big deal to me and I've not had anyone complain about it. So for now, I'm keeping that as it might be a little bit grainy on Spotify. But in terms of the actual quality of the images no difference that I can see whatsoever. Um, so it's a really, really great addition to the pipeline, actually. And I think that's something I talk to customers a lot about is just thinking about what steps you want to take place in your workflow. Because, you know, one workflow or one life cycle is not going to be the same as someone else's. And, you know, for for yourself there, Carl, I think, you know, I know you're going down the path of using Hugo, et cetera, as well. And you might decide, hey, actually, I don't want to do it in the staging sites. I don't want to have to keep processing it all the time. I just want to do it in production, for example. And you know, that's completely valid. You know, there might be different requirements there, for example, and why you take that path as I opposed to go and do another path. But ultimately, you know, it's it's a step in the workflow and that's all it is. And this conversation has got me thinking, actually, now that I've brought my MP3 files into Git, and maybe this is a nice point to circle back on, um, could I be compressing those as well? Because today I just do images. Maybe there's more I could be doing. But again, it's fine for now, but uh, I'm always looking to optimize and make improvements. So maybe something for the backlog there. Excellent. Excellent. So um, the text files are not going to be massive. They're not going to be huge. So the images is where you're going to save most yes. of your storage um, consumption um, yes. uh, numbers. So, I mean, that that's excellent. Thanks for sharing that. And the other thing, actually, sorry, you just made me think, actually, about uh, um, the almost the markdown files, I suppose, which is the HTML files, the JSS, the JSS? JavaScript or CSS, I'm combining stuff now. There we go. <laughs> We're inventing new things. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I do if we jump back to the actions here is when I build the site, and I definitely do this in production, so let's go for production here anyway, um, is I build the site with a dash dash minify flag as well. So it will go ahead and minify the outputs as well. So again, so that's a built in Hugo function. Then. Exactly, exactly. And I think the dependencies that I've got on the website then, so for example, Google Analytics, like most websites, um, the web, uh, the podcast transcribe player type thing, um, and some other pieces of JavaScript for the bootstrap stuff. Rather than hosting those on, you know, bootstrap.com or googleanalytics.com, whatever it is, um, or, you know, podscribe.ai, I've brought those files into my own code base, A, from a supply chain perspective, uh, security, let's keep them there where I know what changes are there right now and what version's there. But B, um, I've also gone ahead and downloaded the minified files of those. Those will all be served from the same CDN that your client connects to. So again, there's less requests going back and forth from your clients to servers across the globe and different CDNs to get the content. And what that gives you, just as an example here, if we jump in, um, great addition, by the way, for anyone who's interested in web design is uh, Google Lighthouse. You can go ahead, generate a report inside of uh, web tools. There's also um, uh, GitHub Actions that you can go and run this through as well. So it can be part of your automated pipeline. And I did do that at one point. You can get these assessments then of how you're uh, doing in terms of performance. So you can see, you know, accessibility, best practices, SEO, I'm doing good. Performance, it says uh, my largest content for paint was a bit long there. To be honest, I'd argue it's actually really snappy and quick. I've never really had any issues with it, to be honest. Um, but what I find is actually once I've purged the site at some point, actually that number is a bit lower. So as soon as it's cached, then it does increase as well. So again, it's not the biggest pain in the world that I've got going on there. But you can it's see. give you a good guide as to exactly. how your website will perform for the majority exactly. of people, which is excellent. Exactly. So yeah, Google Lighthouse is a good uh, good tool I've used to help me tune and uh, go towards that uh, optimization route. 
Excellent. I didn't know that was included in the developer tools now on, I on Edge. I think it's an extension. Uh, I think it's an ex... Maybe it's not. Hmm, maybe it is part of it then. Um, because I don't see it in my extensions list there, but uh, yeah, it's a, a nice, uh, nice addition either way. Okay, so um, just conscious of time, it's mm. just off, off it. So um, there are obviously alternatives in, from a CDN perspective. Um, so Azure Front Door um, is a CDN and a load balancer and a web application firewall. So the the choice as to why you didn't pick that is perhaps obvious. Mm -hmm. um, the cost. But is yep. there anything else you want to mention there? No, I th I think the cost is the main one, and I think you know they're both great options. You know, Azure Front Door has been around for in reality, it's been around for years because Microsoft have been using it on a lot of their technologies. When you think about like Office and Xbox and these types of services, they've LinkedIn already served through it currently. Yeah. Um, so they've you know they it's been battle hardened it's already been tested so from that perspective great service but as you say you know i think the minimum uh pricing is 30 pounds for the basic tier now and uh, there's an increase then if you go for the premium with the waf skew as well yeah, and I mean, like 130 or 100 and something per month yeah um, depending on what traverses it for the premium um skew exactly so the TV version anyway but having said that right Great, great service, and for a lot of scenarios, it is the right choice. But for my scenario, where we are just talking about static content, we don't have that need for you know dynamic site routing, for example. We don't really have the need for a full blown web application firewall because there's no SQL backend for SQL injection and all of these kind of things. There's a lot of security that we can start controlling through a CDN and through the site itself. Actually. I don't have the requirements for something like Azure Front Door. If I was deploying some kind of dynamic platform where actually I needed to load balance across different regions, have multiple backend pools, different subdomains, microservices, and a WAF capability and all these things, sure. But for my requirements, it just does not fit and I do not need it. So why spend more money than I need to? Just right. And the the choice of uh, you're using the microsoft version of azure yes. cdn so there are alternatives the alternative versions there are SKUs for akamai i hope i'm saying that right you are um, yes verizon um what's what's the reasoning behind that choice yeah so to be honest it with again the use case we're talking about here is kind of half a dozen of one six of the other there wasn't really much in it there um so if we just jump to the documentation here there's a really good comparison table uh, mm -hmm. that i'll just bring up on screen here here we go so again from a cost perspective i pretty much straight away ruled out premium verizon because the features that come in as part of this like real-time stats edge node performance real-time alerts and all these things are just not things that i require as part of my community site that i'm hosting here right yeah. but when i start digging into the different SKUs here you've got microsoft you've got akamai you've got verizon as you rightly say and for me when i start going through this list dynamic site acceleration not a requirement so you know microsoft is still an option there for example um you know, we're just doing web delivery optimization so great you know that's an option there uh, video streaming we're not doing because that's all done through youtube so don't need to worry about that and when i started going through all of these it really came down that no matter what i look between all of these three there's not really a great deal of difference but actually the one thing that has really added a lot of value is these th few sections here the rules engine that we've already touched upon yeah. and I use the rules engine for a few things. I use the rules engine to force uh, the Apex domain to redirect to the dub dub dub. I use on the dub 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 anyone coming in on HTTP to go to HTTPS, so they are forced to HTTPS. There's no HTTP option at all. And I also add some headers. So I, th I think this was something you and I were talking about previously there, Carl, but uh, there's a number of headers that are useful to put on your website to tell your browser effectively how to deal and interact with the website when you work with it. Why should you care about that? Well, again, things like uh, cross-site scripting and these types of things and potentially... We have a second, actually. What's that? 
which we'll get on to. Ah, second. cool. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll stop us there. But the uh, rules engine itself was a big, big factor for me. And I think there was something in here, and I can't remember where I read it now, but uh, about the time it takes to purge. Again, that's something which could be relevant depending upon how you're operating the website if you want purging to be super quick. I think the Microsoft offering, they say it's within 10 minutes, whereas Akamai and Verizon, they did offer quicker. But for me, again, 10 minutes, am I... Exactly. Am I offering something where it's super critical I get it out within seconds? No. So, to be honest, on balance, the rules engine gives me way more value. So that's why I opted for uh, that approach there. Okay, so we're about to take a bit of a deeper dive into the rules engine, given that I know you handled the security. So let's talk about security. So Mm. I noticed it was a question that I had for tonight anyway, but I noticed a blog post from yourself during the week about how you had listened to Scott Hanselman Mm. um, recently, and he had recommended a website, and you ran your website through it and (laughs) failed. As did I did. um notice so how i didn't have the heart to screenshot the big f in the blog i was like i can't i can't do this <laughs> let, let, let's talk let's talk security yeah and in a platform like this mm. what are your best options for getting that a or a plus um yeah. and keep and protecting the community that are reading your your articles yeah absolutely so number one i think is awareness right with anything to do with security you need to have at least a view on what's going on what's happening so as we both said, right, running through um, securityheaders.com, for example, was a good first step. You know, go to cloudwithchris.com, scan that, and we Don't can go and see. <laughs> but you can see currently it's still looking at an A. And the only reason that it's not an A plus or an A star is, I guess it only goes to A plus, <laughs> um, is because this one here, it seems to think is not implemented. It is. Uh, There's a reason I haven't been able to because of a limitation on the number of characters you can put in the rules engine. So I've done that through the site itself instead. So I'd link that user voice in um, the description or in the chat. Yeah, I will post that in in a moment there. Good suggestion there, sir. Uh, The other one, which is a great site to go and look at here, is um, Mozilla Observatory. So again, I'm just going to put my uh site in there we'll not put it in the public results and we'll force a rescan there as well and what i will do is it will go and do a similar thing there for me go and scan based upon headers various things that might be common things that you could get attacked for and you can see here it took five seconds to go and scan that Uh, we've now got an a plus on this one 11 tests passed for example and we can go and see here that you know, content security policy is implemented. Uh, we've got HTTPS implemented, but with HSTS, so strict transport security, for example. Uh, we're making sure that we're locking down what content can be linked to from the website. So there are all these nasty approaches that people can use to embed iframes or embed things into um, your site, for example, and just to try and do some cross-site scripting. Now, I know there's nothing really back end in my site so i'm not really worried about sql injections but the thing that i have locked down that i just wanted to make sure my community was protected from is those things that when you're viewing my website that you may not need you don't need your camera don't need your microphone i don't need to know your gyroscope i so effectively i don't need to know your location but google Analytics will pick that up so i think that one might still be in there but um you know i don't need to have your camera access or microphone so i've explicitly set those as these are things this site does not need so website do not allow that at any circumstances so that if somehow someone was able to go ahead and inject something nasty in there they still wouldn't be able to go ahead and do that so that is controlled uh through as i say through some of these headers that i set there then as well excellent so um i'm on the same journey um several weeks Mm -hmm. uh, slash months behind where chris is currently um so i i posted a blog post recently about deploying the platform with azure bicep what i intend to do is to incorporate um those uh cdn rules rules engine rules into the bicep code of the CDN endpoints. So you'll be able to check that out on the GitHub. So I'll reshare that on Twitter when that happens. But do you want to quickly, I am very conscious of time because there are a few more things I'd like to talk about. <laughs> sure. Want to quickly talk us through the rules engine um, stuff where you've got this configured? 
Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Let's go ahead, jump over to the rules engine. Here we go. Uh, so a couple of things to note. So I just pasted a link in the chat for anyone who's following along and interested. Uh, the first aspect that I mentioned there is that this HTTP header value here, if I just go ahead and type in a ton of Xs, and we keep going, keep going, keep going, and I'll just hold it down. Um, this is what you're limited to 128 characters. So what I've got in my website, if I jump back and we look at the code, uh, and this is me thinking on my feet now where I remember it being. <laughs> Layouts, partials, I think it was in the SEO. If I remember rightly, I put it in there. Yeah, there we go. Um, I have my content security policy set in here because if I zoom out, you will see that this is a super duper long <laughs> line there. So I was saying, you know, YouTube can uh, embed files on my page. Uh, Google Analytics will uh, be allowed. Uh, calling my podcast .cloud with Chris uh, where endpoint, for example. Uh, the endpoint for the transcriber, for example, is allowed. So all things that I know are used as part of my site and my system are effectively on an allow list here this is what content security policy is doing now that long list unfortunately i can't fit in the 128 characters so gone ahead and embedded it in html instead that's another approach we can take to do this um, the other nuance that is worth being aware of is you can only have a max of these five global rules as well but don't worry Dear listeners, there is a workaround. Uh, and the workaround is you can just go ahead and do something like, you know, if you need, if you want your traffic to always be HTTP, then you force it to HTTPS. And if you know the traffic has to come in HTTPS, then you have a conditional rule for that. And you go ahead and append some of those extra rules in as well. So there's always ways to kind of work around some of these limitations. But again, there is another. Um, use a voice page on that one so i'll put that one in the chat here as well but yeah this is effectively what we're doing the rules engine here is just saying anything that comes in always add the strict transport security header with these values add the x frame options with the same origin x content type with no sniff refer policy strict origin you know i'll put that back in there now permissions policy and you can see i'm not allowing geolocation not allowing camera we're allowing full screen from YouTube, so YouTube can full screen the page. Uh, microphone is not allowed, and accelerometer is not allowed. So all of these things we can see, we're being very specific on what is and isn't allowed. Um, then, again, as we mentioned earlier, if it's HTTP, don't allow it. HTTPS has to be forced. And then if it is coming on HTTPS, also add some cross-site scripting protection in there as well. That's the header there. Okay, excellent. So you're... you're with a platform like this, your general challenge is just making it as secure as possible. And, and the the website you linked before and that Mozilla Observatory is uh, our good starting locations for seeing what sort of score your website will get. Mm -hmm. um, don't be shocked if it gets an F off straight off the bat. Exactly. Um, and then you can make the changes to make it more secure. So A plus or A star is the goal yep. um, to make it as secure for the community as possible. Absolutely. So, Let's talk. So, the, in terms of any other challenges you want to talk about, or, or are you happy to go on and talk oh, about? Uh, let, let's, let's move talk on. Production. Um, so, um, I want to wrap this as close to nine o'clock as possible. Sounds but good. Let's, talk, let, let's spend a few minutes talking about the GitHub Actions workflows mm -hmm. in a bit of detail. So, let so how you go from writing your content in Markdown, and how it then goes from from an, from the content mm -hmm. to go through your workflow and eventually ending up live and in production yeah um, yeah sure website so i guess you know there's a couple of ways that i do this um one way that i do it is using github code spaces so we can go ahead uh open that up here and github code spaces is currently in beta so if anyone's listening in and wants to try it out you have to go on a waiting list um, but effectively imagine it like your ed your development environment in the cloud so i don't have to have all those dependencies on my machine i don't have to worry about installing all the hugo frameworks and all the things that i need i can just go ahead be productive super quickly super easily um, using something like github code spaces so you can see this was a container I already had, so it didn't have to build it over again. It just runs, spins it up, and off we go. And what I can do 
is for example we're obviously doing this talk right now uh no actually it's an episode isn't it uh and i cannot remember for the life of me what i called this file so let's go and take a look at the episodes here so we have got uh discussing cloud with chris architecture and github so discussing cloud with chris architecture and github here we go so what i would do at this point then is i'd first like any kind of workflow with Git, make sure I pull down the latest changes first and they all look good. So we're currently in master. I don't want to edit my changes there. I want to edit from dev. So we're going to go ahead again, just uh, make sure we're looking at the latest and greatest. Now, in terms of the page itself, there's nothing really to update because when I go over to it, the YouTube link is embedded. Yes, I'll upload the MP3 later, but for the purposes of what we're talking here, um, I'll just go ahead and make a couple of tweaks for a moment. So all I'm going to do is in my markdown files, I have a flag which says upcoming is true. Uh, and that's how my site decides, should it be content which has taken place or should it be content coming up in the future? I could do it based on date, but I just wanted to have an extra almost feature flag or safety net for myself there. So I can go ahead and remove that. So at this point, uh, what I would normally do is uh, not edit that in dev so instead let's create a new branch here and let's go and say uh, carl talk for example here and what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and delete that line and i'm just going to go ahead like my normal git commit flow here add that file uh, oops no i don't want to discard don't <laughs> click the wrong button chris come on <laughs> demo gods are watching uh yeah. is we want to go ahead and just say you know this is a uh, updated and taken place for example something like that so go ahead commit that we'll push it and at this point i can now navigate back over to my github repo and you can see that it has detected hey you've gone and made a new push on this preview branch also if i'm in uh, my github code space here you'll notice i get this pop-up which says hey would you like to create a pull request for this branch as well so i'll go ahead and do that that looks good now by github actions i don't have triggered if something's committed to the preview branch it's only when there is something from that preview branch as a pull request so if i go ahead now uh we go and just make these changes here so uh promote carl's talk from upcoming for example uh we'll go and create that that's now creating my pull request over in github for me which then starts triggering my github action workflow so if we jump back to github here we will now see in github actions we've got this preview workflow which started about 11 seconds ago or 13 seconds about the time that we uh just created that pull request and you'll see we now have this extra pull request over here as well so what this will now do is this will go ahead and create a effectively a folder in my preview site for me so in my preview.cloudwithchris.com all this is is effectively just listing the directories which are in my storage account here so if i go to preview you can see that i've got one for example on logic apps uh you and i carl were talking just before we went live here and uh, this was a blog post that i was writing earlier today and preparing to go out um, so here we go you can see that that one is prepared and ready to go um, some of the things don't render quite right in the preview just how i'm uh, hosting that site but that's okay that's no problem um, so that just gives me a bit of an indicator hey is the content roughly looking as i would expect it to be and giving me a quick sanity check so mm -hmm. at that point what i would do then is i'd go okay everything looks good to me uh, so i'm going to go ahead jump back to the pull request uh, and I'm going to go ahead and review that. But, uh-oh, something looks like it's not good. Ah, it's because I've committed from GitHub code spaces. I haven't signed it with my uh, GPG keys, my security keys. So I'm just going to override that here because I know it was me. All is fine. Yeah. So Which can... was another blog post that you did um, about signing your GitHub. Um... Yes. Yes. Long story short, definitely go and read that series again. Another Scott Hanselman inspired blog post there. But, uh Git is very easy to spoof someone. Yep. Uh, if you want to prevent that, use signing keys and use GPG for that. Uh, and I've got four posts which explain step by step how to go and do that and the different phases and the stages of how you do that. 
Um, so again, yeah, definitely one worth checking out if you're security minded and keen to uh, keep on top of that there. So then what you'll see is uh, at this point, now we've got the uh, dev staging environment triggered because we've done that merge from the preview environment into dev. So it's now getting promoted across those environments. And then I'll, I won't promote it to production yet. I'll add the MP3 files and the other pieces in there uh, at a later point. But you can see that's effectively the process that I would go and take. Uh, so I'd go ahead, merge those pull requests up. And when it came to the main master branch then, before I uh, make the changes go into production, I have to go ahead and manually approve those steps because of the environment protection rules I have in place. So if you remember earlier when we were looking through the preview environment, I had the preview.azure, excuse me, the, um, sorry, the staging.gcp, the staging.aws, and the staging.azure environments there. Um, so you can see I've got the secrets scoped to the different environments there, for example, and you can see on production we have that protection rule to make sure that we go ahead and we uh, have that manual approval step as part of the deployment there. And that's effectively it. It's all code based. There's no kind of UI work there. There's no place where I have to kind of save as draft in an editor and uh, wait for that. It's all stored in Git along with all the MP3 files, as I mentioned there and I keep mentioning. Um, they are done in the exact same way. Uh, but the key part here, and I just want to make sure we get this in, is I'm using Git LFS for that. So Git large file storage, you can see that there. So it's not really stored in the Git repository itself. There's a pointer to somewhere else uh, where GitHub has gone and placed that MP3 file. And what I then go and do is I have a super duper uh, workflow, which goes ahead, uh, does a diff to detect if the MP3 files have changed. If they have, does a diff, only pulls in the MP3 files that are needed and only uploads the new MP3 files to Azure Storage then uh, to make sure again that I'm saving on bandwidth and saving on what I'm uploading there in time and efficiencies there. Excellent. I think we could spend an entire hour talking about the GitHub Actions workflows. In fact, I think we might schedule another one of these if you're game and just I... talk about the GitHub Actions workflows. Absolutely. Absolutely. We haven't gone into as much detail as I'd have liked on the GitHub workflows. Cool. But maybe we'll do that for another session. But I want to quickly cover off. I know it's coming up to nine. So All good. Everybody is bearing with us as, as we wrap up here. But there's still a couple of things I want to cover mm. um, around how you now, how you use the likes of uh, GitHub issues and your projects and the yes. Kanban board type stuff to manage your backlog and your ideas. Do you want mm. to quickly talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So GitHub issues is a very, very lightweight way of, as the clue is in name managing issues, that's where it originated. So mainly to do with bugs, issues, uh, then people started expanding it for things like feature reports, etc. Um, and the way that I'm using it is really to go and manage my content. So you can see in here, for example, I've got a load of stuff on episode suggestions, blogs. Uh, I've got more episode suggestions in here. I've even got some items relating to the website work that I need to go and do as well. Now, all of this uh, is good. I can go ahead, filter down based upon the label. So what blogs have I got? Uh, what blogs are coming up in this month that I need to go and work on, for example? Uh, maybe what's coming up? in this month overall and I can start getting a view of what I need to prioritize and how I focus my time there and uh, working on that. And this is effectively my to-do list for Cloud with Chris. Um, but I'm more of a visual person. So if I jump over to projects over here and take a look at the episode roadmap, you can see that I've got all of those GitHub issues that we looked at a moment ago on this project roadmap effectively. So you don't have to have issues. You can just have lightweight cards here, as you can see as I add this one in. Uh, but you can convert those to issues if you want then and have them as issues. So I don't go ahead and add those one by one. As fun as that would be, I don't do that. Um, as you probably guessed, I try and automate as much as I can. So again, I use GitHub Actions to go and do that. And I have a GitHub Action workflow here, which as soon as there is a new issue created with the uh, title episode suggestion and then some information after it, it is automatically added to the project board. And fun story, the episodes that you see in this list are also not manually populated. So 
people submit their sessions to the uh, to Cloud with Chris through Sessionize. Um, I work with them to establish a good time to go and arrange the session, when we'll record it, when it will go live. As soon as I arrange the calendar invite for the recording, I use a certain title and a certain lookup effectively. And I've got a logic app, which is watching my calendar. That will go ahead. It will add it to mine and my girlfriend's shared diary so she knows when I'm recording. So uh, I'm going to be locked away and uh, lights on and everything. Uh, but then what it also does is it creates a GitHub issue for me then and starts filling up that process and that backlog. And it's really all of those little paper cut integrations there that is my next big focus for Cloud with Chris, trying to plumb all of that together, like the marketing side of things, etc. And I'm definitely still on that journey. Maybe that's something we can talk on in the future. But uh, that's effectively the workflow that I use and how I go and uh, manage that there. Excellent. So that's certainly a step, several steps forward from my OneNote or Notion um, option currently. So definitely be looking at that. Um, funny you mentioned Logic Apps there. Do you want to tell anybody about how you promote your blog at the moment before mm. we uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, let's do that. Um, blog, podcast, YouTube channel, and all of the other things that you're doing. Absolutely. So um, I am on YouTube, so cloudwithchris.com. Uh, that's hopefully where you're watching us live right now if you're watching live otherwise if you're not watching live um, you might be listening on apple Podcasts, you might be listening on google podcasts or spotify cloud with chris on all of those platforms and of course www.cloudwithchris.com as well um, and on there you can go ahead listen back uh, to the mp3 files and as we mentioned a bit earlier you can also Right click on any of the words in the transcripts and read it in real time as you're listening to it as well um, so lots of options there um, in terms of how i i guess evangelize and market that very very quickly maybe we'll leave this as the kind of cliffhanger for an, a future yep. session here um, we have got a logic app and in my logic app if i can find my resource group there we go uh, i have got uh, not that one, sorry. It is this one. I have got a, a number of different steps, and at a very high level, as soon as it detects that there is a new episode or new content available, it will go ahead, pull out the contents, because I pre-approve the social media messages that I'm pushing out for that. It then goes ahead, posts a tweet immediately about that. And what it will also do is in my key vault, I've got some information about my Reddit authentication. I go and get a token to post to Reddit. If the title of the content contains the word vlog, post it to the r slash vlog subreddit. If it contains something related to Azure, go ahead and post it to the r slash Azure subreddit then. So I've got some automation in place to help me with those marketing channels. Very rudimentary at the moment. I really want to expand on that and make it bigger and better with like queues and, uh, you know, service buses and all these things and routing to the right places depending on the content. Very early days yet, but um, that's the grand scheme where I'm going with that. Okay, excellent. So logic apps are awesome is what I'm hearing here. Absolutely. Uh, I'm using them myself um, to every time I post a new article. I have a logic app that monitors the RSS feed from my site mm -hmm. and it'll post to both my personal and the Irish Techie Twitter account, Twitter accounts. And it'll also post to uh, LinkedIn yep. so that uh, I think I have it polling every three hours. Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as there's a new blog article written, um, now it doesn't, it just monitors the posts. It doesn't monitor nice. any other changes to the site. So it's safe for me to make changes outside of blog posts. Awesome. Um, but monitors the, the RSS feed. So anything that's new, it'll immediately go and post that on the social so that it generates some traffic to the site, which is excellent. So there's an awful lot um, you can do with Logic Apps. So if you haven't uh, touched them or you're not really terribly experienced with them, I suggest you go and uh, get hands on and start playing with them. Absolutely. So, Unless there's anything else you want to add, Chris, I think that's a good place to end it. There's certainly a, an, a, an entire other session on GitHub Actions here, um, I think, <laughs> that we need to talk about um, just to get into the, the, the you know, from, from start to finish of your GitHub Actions workflows and how all of that works for somebody not familiar with, uh, with GitHub Actions or with pipelines in general. Sure. Um, so that's, that's maybe worth doing and talking about. Absolutely. But, 
from my point of view, I want to thank everybody for tuning in or for anybody watching this in the future. Um, thank you for watching. Uh, but this is, I hope, has been very useful. It, it's been an opportunity to dig deep into the platform and the architectural decisions and, and how a blog site such as this can operate, keeps the cost low. And the reason that it's hosted on Azure is because we work with Azure um, day in, day out. Um, and it's it's a platform that we enjoy working with. So hosting our blog blogs there is a is a no brainer in reality. So thank you very much for tuning in. Um, have a good evening. Thank you. There we go, folks. So I don't think I have anything to add after Carl's excellent closing remarks there, apart from thanking Carl for uh, being an awesome host. As I say, I was the guest today, so. Uh, not really thinking of the questions and the direction, but more focusing on telling my story, really, and talking about how I've done things here. So you know what to do. If you've liked this session, if you want to see more of this type of content where we have more discussions around architectural decisions, why we've made those decisions, and, you know, these approaches and getting into the nuts and bolts, let us know. Tweet us. Uh, Carl, IT Nerd, uh, Red Bowen on Twitter. We'd love to hear your feedback. Also... If you do like the session, you can go ahead, like the episode on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube and hit the notification bell so you know as soon as there's new content. And of course, I mentioned it several times in the episode, but just in case, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and cloudwithchris.com. So with that, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you for joining us. There is another episode out tomorrow. It is an awesome one. It's going to be all about Azure Spring Cloud, Spring Boot and Spring Framework. You don't want to miss that one. So check that one out. And until next time, bye for now.